Welcome to Alzheimer Speaks Radio. I'm Lori LeBay, the host and founder of Alzheimer Speaks. Um, before we get started here, I just want to um, give a shout out to all of those um, who have dealt with 9-11. Um, I, I just really feel that that needs to be recognized, that they, we still hold them all in our prayers and thoughts um, during that turbulent time, as well as everybody who's been going through this bizarre weather with Harvey and Irma. <clears throat> in fact, our guest actually lives in Orlando and survived the hurricane. And so we may ask him a little bit about that too before we get into our dementia discussion. And then uh, also just to acknowledge that September is World Alzheimer's Month too. So in case you're not aware of that, you're just gonna see a lot of increased news and information uh, regarding dementia during this month. Um, for those of you that are new to Alzheimer Speaks, um, bottom line, we're an advocacy-based company providing multiple platforms to shift our dementia care culture from crisis to comfort around the world. Um, we're also viewed as a media outlet for, for many. We believe that by joining forces and sharing knowledge and having these everyday conversations about life with dementia, uh, that we're going to be able to remove some stigmas and we're going to be able to raise awareness and share resources that are available to all of us and hopefully that will help each of us live better alongside the disease. At our core, we also believe that collaboration is the only way we're gonna win the battle against dementia. And I know for a fact that that's working thanks to each and every one of you. You see your likes, your clicks, and your shares with your Facebook friends, your LinkedIn colleagues, your Twitter tribes, your Pinterest peeps. Um, has had a huge impact on Alzheimer's Speaks. By you sharing our information, you got us acknowledged as the number one influencer online regarding Alzheimer's, according to Sheer Karen, Dr. Oz. And we were also recently recognized by Maria Shriver, excuse me, as an architect of change for humanity. Um, and so, again, those acknowledgements um, go to each and every one of you because I really do feel that it's a, a team game. The other thing that I want you to understand is when you share information with your sphere of influence, um, a lot of times people don't realize how important those few seconds are. But all of us have people in our sphere of influence who are dealing with some form of dementia. Um, maybe they're diagnosed, maybe they have a loved one or a coworker or a neighbor, but they haven't really come out and talked about it. They could be in denial, and the more information that we have out there, the easier it's going to be for them to grab it when they're ready to deal with the disease and get more educated. So again, I just thank you so much for, for helping raise awareness, especially in this critical month of um, World Alzheimer's Month. <clears throat> I also uh, like everybody to know that everyone could be a guest on our show. Um, we um, feel it's really important to raise all voices. So if you're diagnosed with dementia, if you're having memory problems, if you're caring for a loved one, if you have a business, product, service, or tool, um, or maybe you are involved with research, could be a film, could be a song, could be a book, um, reach out to me and let's have a conversation about having you on the show and raising your your particular passion um, and pushing it out to the world. Um, what else do I want to tell you here today? Um, remind people that there is still room on our cruise that we are taking November 11th through the 18th. We're going to be going to the Caribbean. And yes, we'll still be able to go. Our, our ports may change. Um, we'll find out probably in a couple of weeks there. Uh, but we have a fabulous team for our symposium. Cindy Lazinski, who is uh, working on a dementia-friendly community in northern Colorado. We have Becky Watson, who is a music therapist. And then we have four people living with dementia that will also be speaking. Harry Urban, uh, Michael Ellen Bogan, 
Lori Shear and Mary Reed. So um, book now because it, it is filling up quickly. And again, you can just go to alzheimerspeaks.com to get more information on that. Um, let's see. Who else do I want to give a shout out to? Um, the American Senior Magazine is a, is a really new platform in print, and it's a wonderful magazine. It's large, it's got big print, um, and it has really interesting articles. So if you haven't checked them out, check out the American Senior Magazine. Also, the Alzheimer's Research and Prevention Foundation is putting on a new training program, and um, you can find more information on our blog regarding that. And they really come from a holistic approach. So I think that that might be something of interest uh, for, for our listeners. Let me go ahead and introduce our guest today. We are going to be talking with Kevin O'Neill, who is a film director. And we're going to be discussing uh, film and dementia um, and what he's been up to. Bottom line, uh, Kevin has lived and worked in Los Angeles um, since the 80s, and he has worked on both television and film. Um, some of the shows that you may know are Dr. Quinn, The Medicine Woman, Beverly Hills 90121, and Highway to Heaven. Um, in his 30-year background in acting, he's also made, um, has made him a really strong director four actors, and he has written and directed several short films. Um, a couple of examples are called Clark, Captain Finn, and Lean. Um, and um, he, he just um, is doing a new undertaking that, is, uh, that he started in Los Angeles with uh, veteran Eddie Jameson. And uh, Kevin's short films have toured lots of the, the film festival circuits, winning 10 Grand Jury Awards, which is pretty cool. And he's written four feature scripts, uh, Thundersmack, um, Undertaking, and Flamingo Kids. He, is, um, he also has a course uh, for directors at Full Sail University, where he has taught directing for over 10 years. So um, it's just exciting to have him with us. He's also uh, taught acting classes for over 20 years in the Orlando area where he's from. And we are lucky to even have him here today because he just went through Hurricane Irma. And uh, by generator power, he is with us today. So welcome, Kevin. How are you doing? Well, thank you. That's an interesting introduction. By generator power, I love that. <laughs> People from Florida will love, love that and actually laugh out loud when they hear you say that. <laughs> yep. Well, you know, it was one of those things that we, the whole country, well, really the whole world was watching this hurricane. And, um, you know, we were just in awe of the changes with it. About and, and thank God it wasn't as bad as they said it could be, you know, in the beginning there. So, again, we're just yeah. thankful that you and your family and friends are safe and um and that you're up and running and kind of back to normal as far as uh, Floridians go. Like you said, the generator is just kind of a normal part of your world down there, I would imagine. Yeah, it really is. We we basically live off of them uh, quite a bit during the hurricane season. And uh, we've been through a lot of these. Since I moved back from L.A. to Florida, I moved back here in the 90s. Uh, we've had some very big ones. Charlie was the one that came through Central Florida, and there were three of them that came through. So that was the first time we purchased the generator uh, wow. back when Charlie came through. And, um, yeah, so it's, it's a way of life here. You, you learn to live with them. And uh, it's just something that you, you rely on because power is cut off quite a bit, not just from hurricanes, from just power outages because of storms that come through. So mm -hmm. it's quite common. Okay. Well, and it's it's kind of funny when you said you just learn to live with them. It's kind of like dementia. You just have to kind of learn to yeah. live with it, cause, and you never know with the ups and downs. Can you tell our listeners, have you been personally impacted by, you know, family or friends with dementia? Yes, uh, Lori, I have. As a matter of fact, a year ago, uh, before my father passed away, he was diagnosed with a dementia, early dementia, and we were told that he would eventually go into full Alzheimer's. Um, he passed in a year and so as a family we were very thankful that we never had to deal with this permanent loss but 
Um, I can tell you that what we witnessed was not at the scale that most people, probably most of your listeners, uh, you know, deal with on a daily basis. So we felt fortunate that we didn't have to see him go to that extent, but it got pretty bad uh, in, the, in the last days of his life. So we do understand it. I do understand it on a personal level. And it, it basically inspired a, a script that I'll talk about later, uh, a little short film that I'm writing. But, you know, basically watching this man who uh, was a very powerful man in our life, uh, raised his family, five kids, and uh, a wife, took care of a wife, and five kids, all on one income. And that was who he was. He was always in charge, and he was a very sweet, loving man. And then for him to lose his memory was, was painful, very painful to watch. Oh, yeah. I, I think everybody can relate to that. Um, it's not, mm -hmm. a, not an easy disease. And uh, one that I think, even if you're expecting the diagnosis, still takes, takes everybody back a step. Because mm -hmm. then you want to know what's, what's next, and nobody can really tell you um, just because there, there's not a you know, a, 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 you know, guide, uh, you know, kind of a dummy's guide to dementia, you know, in terms of step A, B, no. C, it, it just, it doesn't follow a pattern. Everybody's a little bit different. And so I think that's one of the most frustrating and scary things for, for most families and individuals dealing with the disease on a whole. Um, why don't you tell us a little bit about your film company, Olive Ranch Road Productions? Okay. Well, Olive Ranch Road is a road I grew up in in uh, Roseville, California in the 60s. And uh, I did a lot of writing as a kid. I started my writing career very young, uh, that very active imagination. We lived out in the country. And, of course, in the 60s, there, was, there were no computers. There was no social networking. So we, we basically had, you know, and we lived on a farm, which was nice. So we had a lot of places to play. And so I started writing uh, short stories and things that I would write for school. And I always thought that if, if I ever, you know, delved into this in the business, that Olive Ranch would be the place that I would acknowledge as where uh, all of this started for me in my life. So Olive Ranch Road Productions became a company, and uh, in 2006, I started writing and directing short films. And, uh, you know, it, it, it's funny. My, it's not funny, but my stories are pretty much about the struggles of humanity, and they always have been. I, I don't really know why that started for me, but... I will say that in 2006 is when my mother was passing away. She had been dying for two years with a brain tumor. And I think I just saw her and the struggles she went through, and it just made me think a lot about life. And uh, so I started writing my first film, uh, and uh, it was based on, on her. So uh, I decided to make the company, and we, uh, as a company, put together several short films uh, that there's five short films that I've written and directed, along with some music videos that I've done. But I just started a new business with a friend of mine uh, named Phil Deans, who's brilliant at marketing. He's been in marketing for Channel 6 News for 26 years. We formed a new company called Plot Twist Media, and I bring this up because we're now going to fo focus together on telling stories that create positive change. And we, he believes in that. I believe in that. And so that's a big part of where Olive Ranch Road is actually heading. Olive Ranch will go away. But it's that kind of being, you know, immersed into this new company. Mm -hmm. Are you looking at like specifically social issues or individual or a little bit of both? Everything. We we're actually looking right now. I just got a call from my sister and over in Brevard County where she lives. Um, there's a woman who escaped from Columbia with two children or three children at 18. And so I heard she called me and told me the story. And so I've already talked to Bill about this. We're going to go. I'm going to go over and interview her this week sometime. And uh, and we have other stories as well that we're doing um, that fall into that same criteria. It, it's kind of it could be individual stories. It could be documentary. It could be a story that inspires the script. Most of my stories that I've written have all been influenced by thoughts and ideas about things that I've heard about over life, and I can tell you about that in a little bit. But, yes, uh, that, that's basically where we go is whatever, wherever the humanitarian aspect of the story comes in, that's where we go as a film company. Okay. Sounds, sounds very interesting. Well, heck, you could start right down in Florida and <laughs> cover the hurricanes and the way people are pulling yeah. together, you know. 
there's a lot of stories happening right now, believe me. <laughs> yep, yep. And I think tonight is their big fundraiser on all the channels, if I'm not mistaken, for Harvey and, and Irma. Um, oh, wonderful. Yeah, Harvey really needs it. They not, not that Florida doesn't believe me. Florida does, but Harvey really needs it. Those people are completely underwater there. Um, and, you know, we have, an, I don't know if you know this, but in the news, Jose is another hurricane that's been kind of spinning out, and they're telling us that possibly could come in. Yeah, that's so what I it, heard. It's very busy season. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah, I'm just glad I'm not out on a cruise ship now, that's for sure. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> With everything going That'd be rocky. On. Yeah, yeah. Well, that was the one thing I told the uh, travel agent. I said, yeah, I'll do, I'll do a cruise, you know, for dementia, but uh, not during hurricane season. So we should be good uh, in uh, mid-November. Um, oh, but, no, it, it, it kind of wraps up towards the 1st of November. Mm -hmm. It's very rare because the waters cool down. That's what drives most of the hurricanes to, to come this way yep. is they feed off the warm waters, and that should be pretty much gone by you know, early November. So you should be good. We hope so. We Sounds hope like a great so. cruise, by the way. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, we're very excited about it, very excited, and uh, it should be a lot of fun. It's all really about um, building camaraderie. And doing that mm. through education and then just a lot of time to relax and rejuvenate and just just be able to network and talk with others, you know, sure. about life with dementia. Other people that are dealing with the same issues. Exactly. Well, let's get okay. back to you. I want to I wanna, uh, okay. have you share uh, <laughs> with our audience some of the um, films that you've written and directed. And, um, and then we'll get into uh, your script, The Man in the Woods, um, where you okay. can talk about that. Wonderful. Well, my, you know, I, when I first wrote the first film I wrote was uh, titled Clark. And it, and again, uh, going with the theory that we always do stories that are about change, um, Clark was a story about uh, mental and ph physical child abuse. And uh, that was my first film out of the gate. And actually, the sad story there is that my mother never witnessed me, uh, witnessed the film that I wrote and directed. She passed away the year that Clark actually uh, was shot. So she never saw that film or the ones that, you know, were after that. Mm -hmm. uh, Captain Finn was another story that had Spencer Locke, who's an actor from Los Angeles, a wonderful friend of mine who played the lead in it. And um, the story about a daughter trying to rekindle a relationship with her father who's in prison. Uh, the next story I wrote and directed was what's called The Letter Carrier. And it was about a, about a loss of a spouse, uh, a man who's a postal carrier who meets a woman who... Uh, is blind and decides to read all of her mail to her because the postal carrier that was delivering her mail was killed and he knew it, but she didn't. So he started coming around and actually reading her mail for her. Uh, Lean was a story of a non-dialogue piece, seven-minute piece uh, about racism and undertaking. And by the way, a lot of these films I'm talking about are on my website. Well, I, wish, I know you're showing them a link. So if anybody's interested in seeing the films, most of these that are no longer in festivals are going to be available on those links. Um, it, uh, Undertaking, and you've already mentioned this, Eddie Jemison uh, was in my film Undertaking, and he starred in Ocean's 11, 12, 13. He played Kirk Stacy Boss and iZombie and Dr. Soul in Chicago Met. So he works a lot. Uh, he came out to Florida to do the story because he loved the story and he loved the character art. And the story is basically about a man with Asperger's who lives on a, a 6,000-acre ranch and his father passes away and bequeaths him the property and the town that consistently bullies him because they don't understand him. And he basically buries roadkill because he didn't get to bury his dog. He buries the, the, the animals that he finds, and people in town think he's killing them and burying them on his property. And then uh, 50 Hours is a feature that I've written about a dying a, a woman who's dying with dignity. And uh, we, actually, there was a novel written since I think you and I first saw it, that's out on Amazon now that Lori Lowe uh, wrote. Beautiful novel that she wrote um, that uh, I can t send you the link later that you can put out there um, that we're planning to shoot in the near future. We have two L.A. actors that are I've already met with in Los Angeles so very interested in the story. And, and basically it's about a man named Franco Alessi who um, is trying to outrun the ghost of his past. He, he gets a DUI. Ordered to Serve 50 Hours, which is the name of the novel and the movie of community service. And you meet this woman named Aubrey, and it's their unusual connection because she's dying in 30 days, and he is trying to deal with you know his own issues in life. And it's this life-changing story about lessons and friendships and acceptance and the importance of 
appreciating what you know life is, is really about what it should truly be about so that's kind of where i'm at and i have a lot of other things i've got four features you mentioned um thunder smack which is a comedy i've got um the feature of of uh, undertaking i've got one called Flam- flamingo kids which is very interesting um it's uh, about shuffleboard because that's coming back and uh it's story that's uh, a cross between uh, grumpy old men and dodgeball you want to kind of put that into perspective <laughs> and i always get a laugh when i say that so it's a great pitch line but that's that's truly what it is and we're trying to get like a burt reynolds you know a carol burnett kind of cast together for that one so a lot going on with that we're very excited about that oh very fun very fun well i think the um the dine with dignity that's just such a big hot topic out there um, a lot of people in the in the realm of chronic illness, which dementia is one, I was so concerned about that and really taking a deeper look at what does that mean and what does it look like and, and how are people affected by that and um, how is it done, you know? Um, it, it's, mm-hmm. it's a really, really interesting, I think, really interesting topic. So, um, yeah, uh, I, I, I think it's... Um, also fascinating, the variety of films that you're doing from comedy to really serious to social impact and, and things. So kudos to you. Can you tell our audience um, a little bit about The Man in the Woods and what your plans are for that film? Yes. Uh, Man, in the Woods is, Man in the Woods is actually a story I wrote when I was watching my father over the last year before he pa- or a year ago when he, before he passed away. And we all, as kids, spent a lot of time, I guess, in personal time with my father. And I spent a lot of time watching him because when he would talk, and a lot of your viewers or, or, or listeners are going to understand what I'm saying here. When he would talk about the past, his eyes would light up, and he could see it as if it was right in front of him. And as I watched that, the reality of a person who's inside the body, who feels like they are 19 or when they were 20 years old and what they visually see was, was powerful to me as a filmmaker. So I, I thought I'd write this story. Um, and I think what's great about it is that it's, I think going to be powerful in the sense that it's going to show people the other side of what a patient experiences when they have full dementia and Alzheimer's. In other words, we open the story up with the person actually going through Alzheimer's but it's not what you think it is. And then when you realize we come full circle, you realize, oh, wait a minute, that's what's going on. And so that is what inspired me to write it as a, as a, as a writer. And then as a story and a filmmaker, um, we decided we're going to shoot this because it, it involves a boy who's, um, who's uh, in the Boy Scouts. He's out. He's a uh, birder. So he's with binoculars and he's journaling and he's doing all this stuff anyway. There's, so we need these woody areas, and we also need um, this home. And we found this farm that we shot on would be perfect. We shot Undertaking on um, in 2015 with Eddie Jemison. And the great thing about it, they actually shot the movie Rosewood. John Singleton featured film Rosewood in 1997. They built the entire town of Rosewood in this, on this, uh, this property. As I, as I said, 6,000 acres. Mm-hmm. So I think that this story is going to have a big impact on people because for the first, not really the first time, but for a moment, I think you're, it's almost like, I don't know if you saw the movie with James Garner called The Notebook. Where oh, yeah. He's reading to a woman. Yeah. yeah. Well, it was that realization in that movie where we see that he knows her and she knows him, but she doesn't remember. It's going to be that same moment for most people watching Man in the Woods. Because they'll realize, oh, wow, that's – because everybody I tell this idea to has always said that's, that's incredibly powerful. Mm-hmm. And I think it's going to touch a lot of people, and I'll probably come back to you once it's finished and get it on your site somewhere where, once we get through festivals. And also talk to you about festivals that you think would be – you know, would like to see this film because I think it's going to touch people who don't understand dementia and Alzheimer's, mm-hmm. who don't truly know what's going on with the person inside the person. So it's, I'm very excited about it. We want to try and shoot it in the fall, and I'm actually talking to an actor in Los Angeles named Peter Onorati, who's, who's going to be in 50 Hours, my film, about playing the lead in it because he, he loves the idea. 
and uh, we're very excited about it. I think I think it could be a very very powerful film in festivals. So when you're looking at shooting something like this, do you have an idea about length of time that the film will be and how long it'll take to actually shoot and then edit and the whole process? Yes, every film that I do, um, it, there's, a, there's about six months usually of pre-production that we go into. Um, once I finalize a script and I start putting actors into agreements and I bring my crew together, uh, we spend a lot of time talking about storyboarding and shot listing the film. Uh, the film is only seven minutes, only seven pages, which equates to basically a minute per page. Um, that doesn't include, you know, credits, opening or ending credits. But usually, any film under ten minutes is, is usually a very good, uh, is in a good position to be in the festival. So I, I ventured that this film will probably be a seven-minute film. Uh, it will take, because of location, if we can shoot where I'd like to shoot, um, I'd like to shoot in a actual hospital. And then in the in the uh, uh, same exact place we shot Undertaking on the farm, and, and in the exterior of the farm. So it would probably be a four day shoot, and then we have to go through post, which is to uh, get the film cut into you know what we all agree is, is a good story length, mm -hmm. and then go into color correction, and then we go into musical composition. And it's it's quite a process. I, I imagine at at, early, at the earliest, if we did shoot it in the fall, which is hopefully where we set it, then probably by next summer, early summer, we'd be able to release it with everything done, fine tuned, and you know where we think it should be. Quite the process. <laughs> it is. That's only a short film. Yeah. And that's the interesting thing. Most people don't realize that. Somebody said this to me one day. I said, "Man, I." I work so hard shooting a film that's 10 pages long. And I said, well, you're doing everything you do to do a feature film. The only thing is you're doing it for, you know, for 10 pages. Mm -hmm. You know, you add another 110 and you have a feature. So he, yeah. said that, he said that, and I remember thinking that's exactly right. Everything, the same amount of work goes into it. So it's quite a venture, yeah. You have to deeply believe and love what you do because <laughs> it's, it's a commitment. Yeah. So how I got a question for you as far as mm -hmm. do you have to drum up financing along with that or is that already in place yes. for you or OK? No, we have to drum up financing. Um, and it's and it's an interesting thing. Um, we what in the past we've done is gone through you know, some of the social network sites like GoFundMe and uh, Kickstarter, which um, we might try that there. They they're hit and miss. You never know with that. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, we are. In fact, if anybody's listening <laughs> and they're interested, then uh, you know, please contact me. You'll have a contact on here if you're if you're passionate about this story. But uh, yeah, there's there's social networking. There is uh, also fund. I mean, most of my films have been funded. I got a wonderful gentleman uh, named. Uh, uh, well, I can't say his name. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, oh, uh -oh. executive producer. <laughs> yeah, but I can tell you that he's a wonderful gentleman out of Jacksonville that uh, contacted me after he saw my film undertaking and said, I want to work with you. So uh, we started working together. He, he funded the last two films that we did, um, and that helped quite a bit. But he's run into some health issues, and unfortunately right now he's not able to do that. So, um, you know, we, we are going to be looking for other avenues to travel. It's, it's not incredibly expensive, but, you know, a little short film with cast and crew and, you know, if you get to bring in L.A. talent to fly them in, it could be $20,000, you know. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's a big commitment because you got to pay your editors, your composers. It, it can add up quite a bit. So I have probably the most talented group of people at this stage, 10 years into doing this, that can make a film look like gold. That's the beauty of this. So, mm -hmm. so if there are people listening that, uh, again, want to be an angel, want to get their name on there on the credits, <laughs> Love to have you. That's not what we're just thought I'd mention that. Well, no, that's, I mean, that's an integral part of, of all of this. And so, um, you know, there's listeners that want to be able to help out and, and be part of of a movement, you know, and uh, raising awareness. And this is just another another tool out there and another opportunity for people who are in the position to be able to help with that. So, um, yeah, it'd be silly for us not to not to mention that um, for people. I think Wonderful. I think that that's very thank you very important with that. Um, now, tell us about you're looking at uh, doing a novelization of one of your feature length films. It's like fifty hours. So, 
it, t- tell tell our audience about that and what that what that really means because we don't uh, totally. Anyways, I don't totally understand all the verbiage in terms of what that what that w- looks like. Yeah. I didn't either. I had a friend in Los Angeles who's a film director and a writer like I am. Uh, he did what they call reverse novelization. That is where you – normally a novel becomes a movie, not mm-hmm. the other way around. Normally the movie script doesn't become a novel. But it was a very interesting situation that happened. I had met Lori Lowe, the, the author, and I didn't know much about her. She had sent me a – we met on Facebook, and I think everybody out there in your listener – area probably knows this where you meet somebody on Facebook and you really don't know who they are, but they're nice and you, know, you end up becoming friends. And Lori and I were kind of Facebook friends and she sent me three chapters from a novel that she had written and forwarded to me and said, can you do a forward on this? Can you read it and give me any comments on it? And so I said, sure. And I thought it was her first novel. I didn't know anything about her. So I read this and I thought, wow, this is incredibly good. And I contacted Lori and I said, look, yeah, I'm willing to give you a forward, but this is incredible for a first novel. And she goes, Kevin, this is not my first novel. I've written 50 novels. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I was embarrassed, obviously, at that point. But I said, well, you know what? Can I just ask you some questions about this? I said, I've got this film that I've written, and I've been trying to get through the Netflix and Hulu, and it's an uphill battle all the time. And I've got a lot of people that believe in this story, even people from L.A. But how do I get this into a novel form. She goes, well, what's the story about? So I said, well, let me just send you the script. And I sent it to her. And I think within an hour, she called me and said, is anybody going to write this as a novel? And I said, uh, not right now. She goes, can I have it? And I said, yeah, uh-huh. that would be wonderful. So we spent the next year uh, talking back and forth about this script burst, I mean, version turned into a novel. And along the way, interestingly enough, um, Lori Lowe contacted me one day and I found out she had cancer. And she was not supposed to survive it. Um, so we dropped the story. Uh, I think it was six months to a year that we dropped it, just let it go, because I didn't know if she was going to make it. And then one day we got back in touch, and it turned out she'd been cured through stem cell. Wow. So she said, I, I want it in. She said, I want to take the story back on. I want to finish it. And I have a whole new outlook on cancer now. So I want to do this. So we had a long conversation about it and she started writing it and it's, it's finished. It's available. I'll send you a link to this. It's available on Netflix. I mean, excuse me, on Amazon, uh, under Amazon, under 50 hours. And the interesting thing is that she sent it out to several novelists and one of the, one of the novelists, uh, her name is Catherine Lanigan. She's the author of Romancing the Stone and the Jewel of the Nile. I don't know if you remember those Michael oh, yeah. Douglas movies, but she wrote those and other over 50 novels other than that she said in her comments about the book this is the kind of book that wins Pulitzer prizes she said i defy anyone to start a beautifully written 50 hours and put it down or to go their own lives as if they had before reading this uh, about this remarkable emotional and insightful relationship between audrey aubrey and lost Franca. so she really loved this story and, and it's been out there now a couple months about three or four months and, and we've got rave reviews on it already so if your listeners are novel readers uh we would love for them to do this to read it because if we can get a built up audience we will then i will go back to peter and um, Lindsay in los angeles and say hey i've got an audience let's see if we can get funding let's do this okay. because we'll shoot it in georgia um it's written for georgia as people as people read the novel they'll see that it's written in savannah georgia and it's a touching the uh, actually Lilo's agent read the novel and said this is a Nicholas Sparks piece. He said 100 percent is a Nicholas Sparks piece, which is a huge compliment. Wow. So yeah, yeah. So it's it's powerful and um, it's loosely based on my mother. This is one of those stories that I wrote about my mother when she was passing and the grace that she had in life and, and in death. And um, it's about a brain tumor, which is what my mother had. And uh, there's even we even got permission from um, the uh, the foundation. I'm, I'm drawing a blank on the guy's name, but he's the one that painted in the '60s. He did this TV show, Rob Pop Ross. Pop Ross. Uh, we got permission from the foundation to use his name and likeness and videos and everything because they love the story idea. So, and my mom loved Bob Ross. That's why I put it into the story. Um, so it's it's powerful. It's connected to me. It's connected to my mother, and Lori Lowe deeply loved it, and people in Los Angeles love it. So if your viewers are, or I keep saying viewers, if your listeners are, are interested in a good summer read, um, 
benefit. I think they really enjoy this. It's touching them if they've dealt with cancer, which you know, most families have, then I think it'll touch them in, in a very deep way. Okay, and the title of it, again, is 50 Hours? It's called 50 Hours, uh-huh. and you can find it on Amazon. Uh, if you go to Amazon.com and just type in Lori Lowe, and her name is spelled L-O-R-E-E, L-O-U-G-H, which is a very different spelling, so they may not find it if they don't put it in exact that way. And then they'll find it right there, and they can click on it, and they can get Kindle versions or whatever they want. So. Okay, well, interesting. Very interesting. Um uh, yeah, you have a fascinating world that you're you're living. Um, so. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I was going to say that about you. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what? Grass is always greener on the other side. You know. <laughs> it's, true. true. I, I, I I love hearing what what people are doing, and when they talk with passion about their work, I, I just find it really inspiring. If you know, no matter what it is, I, and I just encourage our audience to you know find their passion, and it's amazing what you know once you do what can happen. And how fast things can, you know, the wheels start turning and you just start connecting with the with the right people to kind of ingrain you in it even more. And I know it's risky and it's scary, um, but I think it's well, well worth the risk. That's uh, anyways, that's my spin on it. And it's not going to be without heartache and, and um, some troubles. But you know what? That, that's in the rest of your life anyway. So it really, it really isn't any different. Um, with that so is there anything else kevin that you'd like to share with our audience oh boy that could take another hour <laughs> <laughs> but i i i love your show um i i thank you for having me on to talk about uh, what i do and it, you know it's exciting to talk about something that's close to home like alzheimer's and dementia like it was with my father and um, and I and I love to talk about my work because I, it's beyond just being a filmmaker for me. I I love you know doing stories about people and connecting with you know humanitarian aspects of life. So I, I just I, I just want to say thank you for taking the time to have me on your show very much. I, I really appreciate it. Well, we appreciate you coming on the show. You know when you're just coming off Irma there, <laughs> and yeah. uh, maybe getting ready for for another hurricane as well um yeah. and, and so i know you've got your your plate full so i want to be really respectful of your time but um yeah so the best way for people to get a hold of you you're on facebook and so yes, th- I am. they can just put in kevin james o'neill and that is with two l's at the end actually i think i think on facebook it's different because kevin james o'neill is what i have i think it, it might be kevin j on there but the, they can check Oh, okay. They'll know when they see it. Yeah. Okay. I don't know if I sent you a link to that or not. But. Okay. Yeah, that's what I had was Kevin James O'Neill. Um, okay, then that's, that's probably right then. Okay. Yeah. And then on Twitter, it looks like it's Kevin O'Neill five. So. Yep. Uh-huh. Um, and then you've got um, your your website, which is the Olive Ranch Road Productions dot com. Um, correct. Where they can, um, and that is where they can see some of these other films and stuff too. Is that correct? Absolutely. Okay. Yes, you can see Clark, Captain Finn, Lean, and Undertaking. Those are all available to watch under the, if they go into the film tab, they can watch all those films. And then they can contact me if they have any comments about the film uh, or any other questions they have. At the end, there should be a place to contact me, and then it just gives me email, sends the email from them. Love to get feedback uh, on their thoughts about uh, my films that are on there or on the films that we talked about that we're doing in the future love to hear back on what they think okay are you ever interested if uh if any of our audience has ideas for films to talk with people on that or are is your plate pretty full? okay of course yes i i have to be that way <laughs> okay you know because there's so many wonderful stories that we don't even know about if my sister hadn't told me about this woman from you know columbia that is the ape i wouldn't know anything about it so yes of course very okay. interested okay well, wonderful. Well, again, I can't thank you enough for your time today, Kevin. Um, it's been a very interesting conversation. And again, you can uh, go to Facebook, Twitter, or his website, Olive Ranch Road Productions, and connect with Kevin. Um, all of those are listed on the radio show as well as the as well as our blog. And um, you know, please go ahead and pass this show on to others. And if you're interested in in uh, maybe a story idea, or maybe you're looking at trying to help finance a film. Uh, Kevin would love to talk to you, so don't don't miss either of those opportunities. Uh, 
Well, thank you again, Kevin. Really appreciate you you being with us and stay safe. And uh, hopefully this next hurricane misses you all. All right. Thank you, Lori. Thank you. Um, I want to um, just again uh, give a shout out to our, our um, staff who are going to be on our Dementia Friendly Cruise and Symposium November 11th through the 18th. Um, with Holland America, which will be um, four people living with dementia, uh, Harry Urban, Michael Ellenbogen, Lori Shear, and Mary Reed, along with two professionals, Cindy Lazinski, who is an RN and is um, heading up a um, dementia-friendly community in northern Colorado, as well as Becky Watson, who's a music therapist, and, of course, our travel agent, uh, Kathy Schof. Um, and myself. There is still time to, uh, to sign up and uh, join us. We would love to have you join us. Uh, what else can I tell you? Um, here on Alive and Social, all of our shows are archived, and we've been doing this a long time now, so there's lots of different shows out there for you to watch. We also do a platform called Dementia Chats, and the last one that we posted uh, talks about the um, impact of laughter and humor when people have dementia. It's quite interesting. On our blog, you will find uh, a couple of um, posts. One it has a really powerful video about kids talking about dementia um, that either their parents or grandparents have. And you might want a Kleenex because uh, there's parts that are just really, really touching uh, on there. And then the Alzheimer's Research and Prevention Foundation, again, uh, just announced that they are um, launching a new dementia program called Brain Longevity Therapy Training. And that's going to be taking place in Los Angeles. And you can find more information out on our blog. And again, you can get to our blog from our main website, alzheimerspeaks.com. Oh, what else can I tell you? We also uh, developed a trifold of tips, um, just helpful tips when dealing with somebody with dementia. And you can download those right off our homepage. And, uh, you know, feel free to go ahead and reproduce that and use that. That's what it's there for. And in wrapping up, I just want to um, let you know we also have a tool called Your Memory Chip, which teaches people to shift from tasks to heart and really focusing on being person-centered. And the only way we can do that is to really make them first. And that means emotionally, too. Um, and a lot of times we focus on our task list, but our emotions kind of trump that when we um, unconsciously are thinking, this isn't what I want to do. Um, but if we can really truly focus on the person with dementia by asking three simple things, are they safe, are they happy, are they pain-free, Typically, our tasks and how we do them will change. So until next time, have a blessed week. And again, thank you for helping spread the word for Alzheimer's Speaks and our work. Bye now. It's time to rethink, renew, and reimagine retirement. Hey, everybody. Jared Sebesta here, host of Retire Repurposed. Now, this podcast is about the non-financial parts of retirement, which many times can be even more challenging than the financial. We believe retirement is not the end, rather the beginning of what could be the most impactful, purposeful, and fulfilling season of a person's life. So don't retire. Become repurposed. To listen now, search Retire Repurposed on your favorite podcast platform, Senior Resource, or Life Audio.